will bring up Chris Fisher. All right, thanks. Have a good one. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you a lot for having me. Can you guys hear me out there OK? I want to thank Mike. It's a privilege to be here living in town in Park City. I've lived here for 10 or 12 years. We live up here and we work on the ocean. And when Mike called me, I was really, I really get excited when I work with big brands who want to do more than just be what they are, right? More than just, a lot of times you set out on a course to achieve something, but then once you achieve it, then what? Is that it? Or is that just the point at where you begin to leverage the sale and substance you've, the scale and substance you've created to achieve something truly great and truly increase your bandwidth from that of an athlete to that of a humanitarian or that of someone who is looking after the future of the planet. So for all the athletes in the room, I got to qualify a few things before I go in here. What we're talking about right now is your brand, not you as a person. Your brand, not you as a person. So don't get personally upset with me if I challenge your brand. That's important, right? I mean, how many of you want to leave a legacy behind that's bigger than your athletic achievements? How many of you want to be more relevant between events? Be relevant outside of your sport, period. How many of you need or want to make more money because you got a finite life as an athlete so your brand needs to exceed your athletic career? That's the sort of stuff we're talking about. So I'm going to tell you a little bit more about who O-Search is because it's a lot like the journey you're on. I'm quickly going to go through who O-Search is and what we've done, and then I'm going to try to apply it to how you can leverage that same type of model for your own brand and your own journey. I'm a kid who grew up in Kentucky chasing fish and frogs around in the woods. I love to go fishing. And it was that passion and that place where I found peace and clarity. And when I was about 29 years old, the company I worked for was sold. And so I had to find a new path. And I felt like everybody was disconnected from the ocean. And I love the ocean. I'd go out on the ocean. People wouldn't know what was going on. I'd see some beautiful things, some terrible things. They wouldn't care. I was 29 years old. I decided I'm going to become the next Jacques Cousteau. I'm going to pour the world's oceans into people's lives at scale, unseen in three generations, because if we don't create a brand like that, the planet is screwed. And I love to fish, so I started a fishing show on ESPN. And in that fishing show, we had this sustainability message, like it's okay for you to fish with your family, but let, let the rest go for another day. And while I was out there, I was out there and I realized that the fishermen and the captains that I worked with in my show oftentimes knew more about the greatest scientists in that particular discipline. And you can't change the future of the ocean on a fisherman's story. You need a scientific published paper. So I decided I am going to pioneer science on the ocean beyond where it's ever gone. So we have the fundamental data set to create an abundant future for the resource. So I started taking all these scientists out with us to help them move their science forward while we were making our fishing TV show. You can make business and do good at the same time. You can do good and do well. So we were out there and we were studying sailfish on this particular trip. And we released this fish and the scientist turned around and looked at me and he goes, we're not going to have any fish if we lose our giant sharks. We are going to have no fish if we lose our giant sharks. We're not going to have any sailfish, we're not going to have any grouper, we're not going to have any wahoo, we're not going to have any tuna. I'm like, wait a minute, what did you just say? He said, sharks are like the wolf. All you guys out here know about the wolf in Yellowstone. They are the line of the ocean. They are the balance keeper. With, if we lose them, we lose the whole ocean. And I was like, wow, what's the status of sharks? Turns out 90% of them are endangered, threatened with extinction. I said, well, let's manage them back. He said, we lack the fundamental data to manage back our giant sharks because they're so massive, no one's ever been able to capture a 4,000-pound great white shark and give the leading scientists in the world access to leverage the latest technology to solve the puzzle of their lives so we can manage them back. And at the same time, they had this terrible brand perception. They needed a new branding agent, for sure. People were afraid of sharks. But the fact of the matter is, 200,000 sharks will die today. 100 million sharks will die this year. We are literally losing the future of our ocean all for a bowl of shark fin soup. So it was about 2007 when I'd done this. Our show on ESPN had become the most watched outdoor show of its time. But it, you know, I knew I wasn't going to shift the tone and the future of the ocean at global scale with a brand based in fishing that had a bandwidth about that big. 
We had to evolve. We had to do more. We had to move from the fishing space to the exploration space. We had to build an enterprise to pioneer research, to create the fundamental data set to make sure that our kids can eat a fish sandwich. And it was going to take a special boat to do that. So I took everything I had, leveraged everything I had. I found this boat in uh, Costa Rica, and it had this lift on it over here. This you see in the upper right-hand corner, I thought, maybe we can get these 4,000-pound white sharks in this lift and scientists can study them. And this is a clip from the very first time we went out in 2007. And every time I show this clip, I just remember the fear, the absolute fear of going out with a group of men and women to do something that had never been done before. There was no book on how to do it. It was fundamentally crucial to achieve it for the future of the resource and our children, but we had no idea what was going to happen. And I'm sure many of the athletes in the room here, you know, you, <clears throat> so many people tell you you're going to do things that are impossible. Well, that's impossible. Nothing is impossible, right? I grew up with these amazing parents. They always used to say, you know, never get overwhelmed by the scale of the challenge before you. Just keep inching forward, right? Because an inch is a cinch, a yard is hard. Just keep inching forward. We went out an inch forward, and this is what happened in 2007. Now he's coming in. Stop, you guys. Go, let go. Slack, slack. Up, up. And when that lift goes in the water, we're exposed. Roll him over if you can. How's this going to end? I have no idea. Sharks moving. Everybody up. At that moment in 2007, I knew that what everyone said was impossible was possible. But now the challenge became, how are you going to fund an enterprise of this scale to move around the world to help all of the finest scientists in the world close the fundamental data gap to make sure we have an abundant ocean? It was all about getting that tag on the top of the dorsal fin of the shark. That meant every time the shark stuck its fin out of the water for five years, we would know where it was, and we could identify where is it mating and help them flourish where they mate. Where is it giving birth and how big is the nursery so we can help the juvenile sharks come up to be the great balance keepers of the future of the ocean? And what was their full migratory range so that we could get every country involved in the conversation to look after their future because it doesn't matter if we save them in the States and they're whacking them in Europe. We will lose our fishery. It will crumble. The consequences of which would be a radical global economic crisis, right? So how are we going to fund it? Well, I leveraged TV. I came from TV, making the ESPN thing. I sold 30 hours of TV to National Geographic, 10 hours to History Channel, sold $20 million worth of TV, put $10 million into the research, and took the other $10 million to make the show, right? We can make business while we do good. Doing good is good business. Right, and just to kind of give you a little bit more example of what's going on around the work in America, we started to see our white sharks uh, showing up at Cape Cod. It was beginning to impact our East Coast fisheries, but we really didn't know what was going on with them. And when we started this journey, um, we went out to put that one tag on that one shark. One tag on one shark. And everyone said that was impossible, but after we'd achieved that, you know, what could we do more, right? So to the athletes in here, this is just a really fundamental, con you know, do any of you guys know what the biggest room in the world is? The biggest room in the world. Everybody should know this. You can just say it. Biggest room in the world. The biggest room in the world is the room for improvement, right? No matter how good you get at anything, no matter what you achieve that everyone said was impossible, are you going to stop there or is it just a new vista from which to look beyond where you can see before? So as you achieve multiple things in your life and in your career that everyone says is impossible, are you just going to stop or are you going to live in the room for improvement? It never shrinks, no matter what you achieve. So we got the tag on the shark, right? But we only learned one thing. We had to learn at a rate that had never been achieved before, and we had to bring together the practical world of the mariner with the academic world of the scientist. So this is just a couple of clips that show you bringing people together on a common vision with a selfless disposition. This is a clip about fishermen fishing for the future, delivering the undeliverable to a scientist who's trying to create the science to create the future. Oh, he's on it. Brett, 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 Brett. He's on it. He's on it. He just ate it. Going under the boat. Uh, 
Not bored anymore. So then, then we get off, lift goes back down to, to buoy her a little bit and then roll her back up on her, on her belly so she's okay. upright. Let me know if she's coming across or if I got she's a bug good. She out. looks good, she looks good, just come straight. You're good. It's too good. Oh, oh, oh! It's too good. Give one. Oh, 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 come on up. Come on up. Stop right there. Stop. Oh, 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 oh. So that is the practical, right? Fisherman, world-class Brett McBride. He's the real-life Aquaman. He's been on the water with me for 20 years. I've never seen such a gifted, talented, organically connected individual to the resource, much like many of you athletes are, to the mountain, right? But we need to leverage his skill to do more. That's what he's doing, right? He's fishing for the future. He's not fishing to say he caught the 10 biggest fish in history. He's fishing to do what he does so we can do more, right? So then you move into the academic world. When we started this work, the scientist, only one scientist wants to come out with us because he wants to get ahead of everyone. I'm like, no, man, we're paying for it. We're, we're putting our body parts on the line. We're bringing all the scientists in here. We're open sourcing this. We're going to make the biggest leap forward on every shark we touch because 200,000 sharks are dying a day, so we have the data we need to turn the corner. So this is six or seven institutions working together to maximize the leap forward in the academic space around Lydia off Jacksonville, Florida. Make sure you can get that thing in her face, that hose. You got that, I'll take the checklist there, Brandon. Total length, 14 feet total, 14 foot female shark. Scalpel, scalpel, or scissors. Yeah. We've already got the parasites, unless we need more. 11 and a half uh, minutes. Spot tag, accelerometer next. All right, we got the accelerometers going on now. Yeah, we're good, we're good. Spot's on. All right, when they're ready, I'll come in. We got Skomal is getting blood. Great job, Skomal. We need a piece set and a muscle plug. All right, when they're what ready, I'll come in. All right, you beautiful, beautiful. I mean, she looks, she looks very placid. She looks great. Her color's great. Water flow's good. The shark, the first one in history, tagged off Florida like this, his name, Lydia Moss. She is the founder of Bradley, a university in Peoria, Illinois, a wonderful friend of Caterpillar, Lydia. Lydia, everybody said, you know, there'd never been a white shark caught and tagged off Florida before. They said that was impossible. We know nothing's impossible, right? We just inch forward and it's just a sense of yard is hard. We fished for 20 days, freezing. We just fished for three months in Africa and we drove 30 days from South Africa after tagging 40 white sharks over to Cape Cod in Jacksonville. We got our ass kicked off Jacksonville far worse than Cape Hope. I thought, I mean, it was brutal. But what was it worth? Lydia swam over 35,000 miles in less than two years putting together the puzzle of the North Atlantic white shark, putting together the fundamental data we need to make sure every person on the East Coast can eat a fish sandwich four generations from now. Connecting us to Newfoundland, Europe, Northwest Africa, most recently pinged just off of the Bahamas, and my guess it's likely she will be in Cape Cod this fall going back to mate. Any of you guys heard of Mary Lee? Mary Lee the shark? Mary Lee pisses me off. Pisses me off. She's got 87,000 Twitter followers. I got like, I don't know, 20,000 Twitter followers. But look at Mary Lee. Mary Lee just for the first time in history showed us where it appears the North Atlantic white sharks are giving birth. She's 4,000 pounds, 17 feet, and it looks like she just gave birth in the New Jersey, New York bite just inside of Long Island, below it. And I think she's resting down there off of uh, the Florida Georgia line before she proceeds back to Cape Cod to mate this fall. So, you know, like, they said it was impossible to tag a shark, right? Why not disrupt the institutional approach to research along the way to make sure everybody's putting the ocean in front of their own institution or their own career? Because you, ha you can deliver the undeliverable. You can do more than just catch a fish for a man or a woman. You can catch a fish for all men and all women. 
and make sure that the research model that is serving the future of the planet is looking after all of us first, rather than an individual or a single institution. So we were doing this, right, and I was like, wow, this, this is really like one of the coolest science projects of all time. We're solving the life history puzzle of JAWS. And all the scientists started to say, who owns the data? Who owns the data? Who owns the data? I was like, who gets to decide that? Well, they're like, well, you're paying for it. I'm like, oh, okay, I'll decide. Everybody owns the data. So we open source the data. You can track our white sharks now. Remember, athletes trying to work in your individuals. I was just a guy who started fishing from Kentucky, who never left the room for improvement. Right? We're talking about open sourcing education and disrupting the institutional approach to research because we are living in the room for improvement. So we open source the data. You can track the white sharks right now on free apps at the OSEARCH app or go to osearch.org. You can track all our white sharks and tiger sharks right now in real time. And people just began to pile in by the millions. And I speak a lot at schools, right? So I go to this school. This lady had leveraged the tracker in her third grade class to teach the kids everything because she had their focus. She had their attention, you know, sharks and dinosaurs. So what did we do? We went out and got a full K through 12 STEM-based educational curriculum funded and written and integrated into the real-time dynamic nature of the tracking. Now we're solving the life history puzzle, breaking down the institutional approach to research, open sourcing data and including the public at a scale unseen in generations while we harbor the attention of the individual student to feed them the fundamental skills they need to get a good job and be the resource manager of the future. We make science coologram. It's exploration in the now, science in the now, education in the now, right? So that's substance, right? That's just substance. So for, for you athletes that are out there, your substance is winning. You must have world-class substance if you are gonna make global impact. But you must also have world-class scale. Substance plus scale equals impact. Substance with no scale, and you're a beautiful tree in the forest that falls and no one hears. No substance with radical scale, and you're Kim Kardashian. So, so, you know, if you want to move the needle globally on something that matters, you must have world-class scale and world-class substance to make global impact. So we started focusing on scale. And this is where I want the athletes to tune in right now. Scale, how are we gonna create scale? There was a couple of conversations just about it. Number one, are you more than just your sport? What is your passion? I did not know that I was passionate about STEM education until I had an opportunity to impact it with the scale and substance I had built in the shark space, right? So when you talk about, there was, I threw this slide in because someone asked a question about social media. Every time one of those sharks sticks their fin out of the water, they're on like this organic media tour. Because the city that they ping in front of wants to cover them, right? Holy cow, there's a 4,000 white shark, 4,000 pound white shark off Jacksonville, Florida. Boom, I mean everybody covers it. What do they need then? They need content. Guess who has the content? I'm the only one with the content. You athletes are the only one with your content. We feed the earned media space the content and integrate the brands that make our work possible into the content we give the earned media space. We leverage the news as our content and brand integrated distributor, right? So I, I saw this, this is, a, this is about how our social media spikes each time these sharks ping off various locations. And I was thinking about the interview that was going on while I was sitting back there. You know, if you're tweeting out that, you know, you're on your way to Vail because you're doing this competition, and while you're in Vail, you're going to be meeting with the kids working on your Habitat for Humanity program, and you tag all the local media, they're going to come tell your story, and it's not going to be just about a skier. It's not going to be just about a skier. You're going to drive the media to your story, and they're going to you say, you know what, I'll meet you on the Habitat for Humanity spot. I'll meet you where we're feeding the kids. I'll meet you where we're driving education. I'll meet you where we're doing the thing that I'm passionate about that's bigger than my sport. And we're gonna integrate my brands into that conversation in an organic way so it's not pushed or fabricated, which as was mentioned before, gathers no traction. But what this is, when they stick their fin out of the water and we tweet that Mary Lee is off Jacksonville and we tag the earned media space, 
it becomes an organic moment for outbound communication that gets received with a much higher engagement rate than just a fabricated, scheduled marketing outbound comms on a social platform, right? So your tour as a skier or snowboarder, your schedule is your organic reason for outbound comms. I'm gonna be here in three days, you're letting everybody know, you're tagging your sponsors, you're tagging the local media, and you gotta add this element to your brand that is bigger than your sport, that is what you are passionate about a little bit in everything you do. Then when they tell your story when you win, it's not just about an athlete, it's about a humanitarian. You know, like when I think of Bono, I no longer think of a rock star. I think of like a world-class humanitarian. Is anyone gonna think about you as something bigger than the sport you participate in? Even if you're the dominant force in that sport, the, the, the life of that is so finite compared to your life of your brand, right? So you can constantly drive the earned media space to create scale. You can control the tone of the conversation. You know how hard it is to shift the tone of the conversation around Jaws? Make people love Jaws? Make people think, oh my God, without Jaws we're doomed? That is a challenging thing to do. But over years and years of driving perceptions, now you see people falling in love with our giant white sharks around the world, understanding without them, we have no future. You can control the conversation around your brand and you can make it bigger than just the event you participate in, right? And the earned media space will gobble it up. If what you are doing is bigger than your sport and important for the future of the planet and you have world-class content to give them, they will gobble it up, gobble it up at an unprecedented rate because they gotta fill their outlet every day. They need story. And you can integrate your brands into that content you give them. And then you start driving radical scale. Radical scale, these numbers are kinda of weird because it's total possible impressions of 12 billion this year. Let's just call it 20%. 2.4 billion people will follow O-Search's work this year. 2.4 billion, not million, billion. And when you integrate a little bit of social scale to it, you're starting to move the needle and you're starting to pour the world's oceans into people's lives at a scale unseen since Cousteau, which you can then leverage to do more than just catch a shark. Now, I hesitate to show this slide. So I, I spent about 10 minutes this morning trying to figure out how some of your all's biggest brands were communicating to see if I was inspired. Selflessness is inspiring. Inclusion is inspiring. And this is what I found. I'm talking about your brand, not you as an individual, for the three people that may or may not be here. Let's talk about, let's talk with Michaela over here first. Let's start here. She's, she's younger, I think she has great potential, and she has less me, me, me in her communication than the other two. Um, you know, it was just a dream, it was a moment ago. It was like, cool, that's kind of inspirational, that's cool, but like, you know, what's important for you, Michaela? What is like your passion? Is it, is it uh, outside of skiing? Is it uh, women's education? There's so many awesome girl projects, girl power projects right now because we can see like, if we can increase the education and the careers of women around the world, it transforms the future of the planet. All you female athletes have unbelievable opportunities like the girl project. Um, Julia actually, while her communication and her description of, her of herself in her Twitter feed is the worst of the three, if you actually look at the content um, in, her, in her Facebook page, the brand itself, she's, she's doing good girl stuff. She's just not communicating about it. She's just talking about her. And obviously, you know, Ted is it's really just kind of like the facts the data. I've won this, I've won that, I've won this, I've won that. That's, that's not really that inspiring. Most people don't know that. Um, but he's, he's in the optics business. Maybe he's passionate about helping young kids who can't afford glasses have glasses. And everywhere he goes, he meets with those kids when he skis and he gives them glasses. 
I don't know what his passion is, but it's organically connected to his life, and it could make the size of his brand go from this to this. Because now as he travels around the world, he's not only a dominant athlete, he is a person who's creating a future for thousands of people around the world, and he's amplified the size of his brand and can integrate his sponsors into that at a level unseen in the past. Which one of these athletes is going to transcend skiing? That's what I was looking at it and I was thinking, wow, which one of these? Because you've got to transcend skiing, right? I don't know. I guess it'll be Michaela. That'd be my guess. But if you're a professional and you just drive your brand, it could be all three. But when you look at O-Search, educate, inspire, enable. How can you, how, how can you disagree with that? Educate, inspire, enable? might even be a little too vague, but it's definitely selfless, right? It's definitely inclus inclusive. So I don't, I don't want to spend too much time here, but I wanted to go look and see. I, I wanted to find out, like, what are these guys passionate about that they want to leverage the scale and capacity that they've created as world-class athletes to make an impact that's vastly bigger than that? And I couldn't figure that out. And I think if you start integrating a little bit into that to your tone, to your sponsors that are in the room here, you'll become someone who's worth investing in because the bandwidth of your brand will be amplified a thousand or five thousand fold. And they will find fun, creative ways to integrate with your brand that you would never, ever think that they would come up with. Caterpillar funds millions of dollars of ocean research. And this is how they leverage it. And why do they do it? They do it because we'll deliver 10 or 20x and earn media value around their brand in the sustainability, education, and public safety space than it costs to actually fund the fundamental research. And as we move around the world, we're a global brand. You guys are global brands too. Your sport takes you everywhere. So focus on those companies that want to leverage you globally. Think as big as you can think with your brand and with your scale. And then try to create like, try to create a model like this for your brand. You know, envision one of the athletes being where O-Search is. Okay, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to go out and win ski races and build radical scale and leverage that to do something amazing for the future of the planet. So when I die, I have a legacy that I've left behind, and I've been able to monetize that over the entire course of my journey at O-Search. We fund expeditions to pioneer research beyond where it's ever gone before, leverage technology to include the world, to create awareness at a scale unseen in generations, the short-term plan to develop the data to manage their sharks in our ocean back to abundance now, with a long-term plan around education to feed kids the STEM-based skills they need to be the data-driven centrist resource managers of the future, all in an effort to leverage that momentum to ultimately affect policy so that we manage the future of the ocean back to abundance, right? So that's what O-Search is. And when you think back on it, you know, it's like, I was just a kid from Kentucky. I used to just love to go fishing and frog gigging. And I fell in love with the water, and then I was like, wow, nobody's looking after the water. How can we do that, right? We found a way, but one thing we were never satisfied, right? We always continued to live in the room for improvement. We were never afraid of any challenge. We just inched forward. We've achieved so many things that people said were impossible. And we will continue to do that. We are going to win the shark thing on the ocean. We're going to stop fish finning. We're going to have the fundamental data we need. We will manage the ocean back to abundance. We are going to do that. So for you all is, can you transition your brand into a, a brand that has larger bandwidth and a much longer life than your actual athletic career? One that has more value to your sponsors. One that says, oh look, I'm a sponsor that wants to be associated with a world-class athlete and a great humanitarian. That has much more scale. They will pay you more money and you will be more relevant, more of the year, over more platforms, and one of the only things I think that was most important my parents taught me that ties everything together is when you go through this journey, anything is possible if you don't care who gets the credit. Anything is possible if you do not care who gets the credit. Thanks for having me.
on, one more. Come on, come up for one question. All right, hold on, hold on. I gotta ask Chris one more question. Sorry, he beat me. Um, so, Chris, great presentation, same tenor and, and, and fun that we had on our phone call. In that phone call, and I want you to relate it to the crowd, um, you know, very specifically, you talked, you know, you talked about it, where can you be bigger than what you're doing? Can you be bigger than the sport? Um, you know, dig into that just a little bit more, and because you had some really good examples on our phone call um, about just talking about potential things that you saw in the outdoor industry that people could attach to. And then very specifically, what I really liked about our phone call too was how you can tie brands to that, because there's a lot of brands here that would love, if their athlete raised their hand for something, they'd jump on it. So just talk a little bit about the machinations of that. <clears throat> well, and just like as far as brainstorming ideas mm -hmm. for your athletes versus my journey? Exactly. Okay. So, you know, I, was, I, I sit around and think about like, wow, what sort of impact could some of your top athletes make if their philanthropic component of their brand was related to all the forests that they ski through every time they move around the world and trying to create an impact to make sure those were healthy and last forever for, for future generations. You know, when you look at, at, at the women, you have a huge, this, this, the girl project, if you look at what Nike's doing, I mean, the data says it, man, if we help our women around the world get to 16 and get an education and not be pregnant, it changes the future of the planet. And you ladies are awesome role models that anything is possible, right? An inch is a cinch, and you're doing what everyone said was impossible. So uh, there really is an unlimited amount of things for you all to engage in. I, I think you gotta, for me, you gotta look within, right? Because you gotta carry it. You wanna communicate a little bit about it in every outbound communique you have planned across your whole strategy, across each different platform. And then when the brands become associated with that, now you're a world-class athlete working on the sustainability of the future of the planets, and they're into sustainability. Almost every big company has to have a sustainability program, or an education program, or a public safety program. So, um, you know, I can't remember exactly what we spoke no, about it. in the car, good, but yeah. I mean, those are, it, there's so many. Look, the millennial is not buying the fabric. Look out. <laughs> the millennial is not buying the fabricated ad campaign. If you want people to buy into your brand, you gotta do something real and give it away. And then the good karma boomerang will come back at a scale and size and speed that you could have never chased. Just do good and give it away and mix it in with your athletic achievements and the bandwidth of your brand will explode. That was it. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, cool. Thanks for joining us. Yeah. All right. All right, thank you. Um, hopefully that got everybody inspired to work out today. Um, so I have my laundry list of announcements here, and then we're going to break. Um, once again, thank you for coming. I know a lot of people come from a long ways away to be here and take time out of your work weeks. Um, you know, we want to make sure that uh, we know, we f you know that we feel that you're very important. 